And before we get started, I would like to say uh, this is based for the introduce the COVID-19 health literacy ECHO team. And I would like to start with uh, our lead specialist and moderator, Dr. Bergen. Hi, everyone. We have a wonderful session for you today. I'm Dr. Ruth Bergren, Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases and a proud member of the Health Confianza team. I'm looking forward to moderating the cases and the Q&A. Welcome. Thank you very much. And I would like to then introduce a didactic presenter, Dr. Ponce. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. I'm an adult ID doc. I do primarily transplant infectious disease and uh, HIV care. And for the past couple of years, lots and lots of COVID. Thank you very much. And the panelists for today will have Dr. Svatek. I was going first. Let me unmute. Mute. I'm Dr. Mandy Spotek with UT Health and Associate Professor of Pediatrics. And I am a pediatric hospitalist with University Health. Thank you very much. We have a panelist, Dr. Fiberkorn. Hi, I'm uh, Kristen Fiberkorn. I'm a, um, a pathologist, professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at, at UT Health uh, San Antonio. I'm also a um, uh, have a specialty in medical microbiology and am lab director of the virology lab at University Hospital. Thank you very much. Uh, also our panelist, Dr. Markels. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Markels. I'm the, um, an adult infectious disease physician in the Army, and I'm service chief of the infectious disease service of, um, at Brook Army Medical Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Uh, Groff? Panelist. Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Groff. I'm one of the infectious diseases pharmacists at University Health here in San Antonio. Thank you very much. And thank you all to be part of this wonderful learning opportunity. And these sessions are possible because of you, your interest, your participation and support. Your feedback is very important for us. Please complete the ECHO survey that you receive when you register. Towards the end of the session, you also want to receive a link for an evaluation. Um, this area is offered the CME, the CNE, and continuing medical education, the ethics continuing medical education. To obtain those credits, please follow up the instructions in the chat. And the activity call for today is 1008-9909. As a part of our agenda, we want to have didactics and then we want to have case discussions. But I would like to mention that didactics and the case discussion are important components of the ECHO model. If you have a suggestions for future ECHO, uh, topics I would like to, um, if you would like to share your experience, please reach out to us. Case based learning is one unique aspect for the ECHO model. We invite you to submit the clinical and no clinical cases. And for those that really present a case, I would like to invite you to consider to present a follow up of the cases. Um, ECHO, uh, it will share the instructions. Uh, finally, ECHO is uh, all teach, all learn environment. So I invite you and encourage you to participate in our conversation by sharing your experience, questions, and perspectives. With no more from my end, I would like to get started with our didactics. Dr. Ponce, this is your space on your time. Hi, everyone. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Awesome. So uh, I was tasked by Dr. Bergen to give an update on what's going on with COVID currently uh, nationwide and in the community. And um, it is all Omicron all the time, as <laughs> we will discuss in a little bit more detail. Um, so these are the topics I want to briefly touch on. The current epidemiology, um, looking at some of the hospitalization, mortality, and long COVID rates with the Omicron variants. We'll uh, touch on current treatments, and we'll do some brief vaccine updates uh, at the very end. I have no financial disclosures. I'm not going to discuss off-label use of medications, although many of these medications are approved under emergency use. And keep in mind, I updated my slides this morning. So <laughs> given the rate of COVID research, stuff may have already changed. But uh, I will keep you all informed if that's the case. So where are we right now? So this is from the New York Times interactive map. This is the data from Texas. So. If you talk to anybody around you, uh, 
many, many people have COVID. We're definitely having a COVID surge. However, that's not really reflected by what we see in on the population level. A lot of that has been due to the fact that we've shifted from in-lab, in-hospital PCR testing to home antigen testing so people can self-test and get started on treatment. While many of the self-test kits do include uh, information so that you can upload the, your result, positive or negative, to a database, uh, many people do not do that. I think what's a little bit more reflective of the current situation is the fact that if you look at the positivity rates of the tests that are done, the vast majority of those tests are going to be positive. Um, I say that this is a stealth surge caused by stealth Omicron. Uh, you know, the BA2 sub lineage of the, the Omicron variant uh, was called stealth Omicron for a while there just because it has something or uh, BA1 had something called gene target failure, which BA2 does not. So here we are, stealth causing stealth. I think part of the reason that we're not seeing as much concern or consternation or, or news about this is that at the very least, despite this, this surge, there has been a decoupling of the surge from hospitalizations and from deaths. The reason for this is multifactorial. One is probably due to evolution of the virus itself, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Two is the fact that we now have interventions for high-risk people to, uh, to abort the course of, of COVID and prevent progression to the point where people need hospitalization. Uh, or they develop severe symptoms. And the other thing that's changed is the fact that we now have very safe, very effective vaccines. Um, when the CDC looks at blood banking samples, at this point, about 95% of Americans have antibodies against uh, 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 SARS and COVID-2. And you know, some of that is due to vaccination. Much of that may actually be due to prior infection. During this first BA1 Omicron wave, it's estimated that something like 40 to 50 percent of all Americans actually got BA1. So I think we have a bit of a, an antibody immune wall against the, the current surge that's again keeping hospitalization and death rates low, at least to this point. Um, one of the ways we can bypass the fact that there isn't centralized reporting of a lot of these results is looking at national wastewater surveillance system data. Um, this can detect the change in the concentration of SARS and CoE2 in uh, wastewater. It, it, the virus is shed into the, the fecal matter, and so you can pick it up on do, by doing PCR testing on wastewater. Um, if you look at this, it looks like you know the we have peaked and we're now on our way down a little bit, but keep in mind that most of the wastewater surveillance sites currently are in the Northeast and in the upper Midwest. Um, Houston does have a site, and we recently started a site in San Antonio, but, um, you know, in much of Texas and the Southeast, uh, we, there isn't a lot of contribution, so it's not quite reflective of what's going on in our locality. So, like I said, up to this point, much of the current surge over the past uh, month or two has been driven by the BA2 sublineage, both the initial BA2 variant and then currently the BA2.121, which has been another sublineage that was selected primarily in North America. However, what we have seen on the national level is that there's now an emergence of further sublineages of Omicron BA4 and BA5. Um, this is reflected actually in our own Bear County data. So this is from the uh, UT Health whole genome sequencing where they sequence all of the positive tests. Um, this is something Dr. Feibelhorn and uh, Dr. David are taking part in. And even in our community, we are starting to see more BA4 and and BA5. This is a little bit concerning just because um, it looks from the initial data that BA4 and BA5 are even more transmissible than the BA1 and BA2 variants. So the assumption based on what has happened thus far is that BA4 and BA5 are going to become the predominant circulating variants in the near future. 
at least in England, not so much all of the UK, but in England, where they have similar rates of vaccination and antibody, um, they saw emergence or, or dominance of the BA4 and BA5 variants in the past month, and they have actually started to see an uptick in the daily level of hospitalizations. So I think it's something that we have to watch closely and be concerned about, uh, just because we tend to lag Europe by about a month, so we may start seeing this uh, relatively soon. Soon. So a lot of what's going on <laughs> is just that we have ongoing viral transmission. And a lot of this is because we, in some respects, are, are requiring people to do their own public health. You know, we're asking people to assess their own risk and the risk for acquiring COVID in the community and then act accordingly just because mandates for vaccinations, uh, for isolation, for masking are, are viewed so unfavorably at this point. And so what that means is that if you look at levels of community transmission throughout the U.S., they are very, very high. Um, at this point, if you look at the same CDC page, what they want you to focus on is not so much the level of community transmission, but the effect that that community transmission is having on the healthcare system in terms of uh, hospitalizations and strain on healthcare resources. Um, you know, so if you look at that, again, we've seen this decoupling of transmission and hospitalization. So many of the counties in the U.S. are at this point still green or yellow. But keep in mind, you know, the virus is continually circulating uh, throughout our communities and currently at a very high level. This is concerning, I think, to me and to most of us, just because this is a rapidly mutating virus and you're allowing it to, under, to continue to transmit. Every time that happens, there's the risk for mutation and then selection for an even more transmissible or uh, potentially even a more virulent virus. Um, this is from a, a, a researcher at the Crick Institute um, who, you know, they've been monitoring the evolution of the Omicron variants. And I just put this in the fact to illustrate that if you look at this S gene, uh, the, the S gene target failure, the COVID virus has basically been mutating the area around the, the S gene target for the PCR test and flipping it on and off sequentially. So I think this just reflects uh, how adaptable this virus is and how quick, quickly it can change. Also concerning about BA4 and BA5 is that, you know, as the, the virus has been mutating, what we're seeing is increased transmissibility, but also increasing antibody or immune escape. So this was a recent study that was published in a Cell uh, not too long ago at the beginning of the month. And this was looking at uh, the neutralization of um, the virus, the BA4 and 5 virus by uh, vac vaccinated serum. And then for a serum from people who were infected with the original Omicron strain, BA1, and the activity of therapeutic antibodies. And again, in all of these scenarios, the antibody effect is reduced. And so that means that potentially the effect of immunization, the effect of prior infection is gonna be less and we're gonna be seeing a lot more in the way of breakthrough infections. So all that to say <laughs> is that I think we should not give up on public health measures in terms of decreasing the amount of transmission. You know, I think that we, especially as healthcare providers, do need to start reminding people that we do have ways to reduce transmission, including masking in public settings, uh, staying outdoors, remaining six feet apart, and then uh, focusing on hand hygiene. And I think this is important because if we don't change something, you know, I think we're just going to be trapped in this cycle of selection of more transmissible variants and, you know, less effective prevention and treatment modalities. Um, I like to think of SARS and CoV-2 at, at this point as a combination of the tortoise and the hare. It's very fast and it's also quite steady. It just keeps going. Like I said, um, as you can see, as the virus continues to transmit, there's been increasing selection for more and more transmissibility. So if you look at the BA1 and BA2 variants compared to some of the original strains, including the alpha strain, you can see that the reproductive number is much, much higher. 
the good news is, at least to this point, um, what we're seeing is that we're seeing that with increased transmissibility, there seems to be decreasing risk for severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Again, there's a lot of confounding just because the standard of care has changed. We have more interventions. We have better a, a better understanding of how best to support these patients. We now have these abortive therapies. So I think that is confounding some of this data, but um, this is a very busy slide, but if you look at Omicron versus Delta, only about 2.4% of people with Omicron ended up uh, needing to seek care either at the hospital or were admitted to the hospital versus 3.28%. And then if you look at the mortality numbers um, comparing Delta to Omicron, in all ages, mortality is actually quite low. Keep in mind the biggest risk for severe COVID has consistently been older age. And once you get above 80 years old, you're still seeing mortality figures at, a, at, a, at about 15.2% in Omicron versus 31% in Delta, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, hospitalization numbers of 15% and 31% uh, Omicron versus Delta, as well as 5% versus 15% mortality um, in this older age group. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that with the increased transmissibility, you know, even though there's less likelihood of progression to hospitalization and death, you're getting a whole lot more people exposed and infected with the virus. And so if you actually look at the weekly hospitalization rate per 100,000 adults, it, back in January, when we had the BA1 surge, we actually had 38.4 people per 100,000 uh, adults hospitalized uh, versus 15.5%. So a smaller percentage of a larger number still ends up being quite a number of people who can have serious consequences and who can put incredible strain on our healthcare system. So again, I think we do sort of need to refocus on you know, transmission-based precautions. The other thing I just wanted to mention, this is actually, I guess, published tomorrow in the Lancet. I found it this morning. But one of the things that we are concerned about, especially in light of this ongoing transmission and the very large percentage of the population that's now being exposed to the virus, is we worry about long-term consequences of COVID, like long COVID or PASC or post-acute uh, sequelae of COVID. At the very least, based on this study from the UK public health system, it looks like with Omicron, your risk of, of developing long COVID symptoms, they defined it as a persistent symptoms beyond four weeks of the initial infection, is lower with Omicron than with Delta. If you actually look at the absolute numbers, it, with Delta, about 10% of people uh, ended up having uh, long COVID symptoms, whereas with Omicron, you had about 5% of people. That's still one in 20 people who get Omicron are going to have long COVID symptoms. So again, a smaller percentage of a larger number is still a significant impact of morbidity on the total population. Oops. Oh, here we go. Um, as I mentioned before, at the very least, you know, if you have a high risk person who requires COVID infection, we now have therapies to interrupt the progression that would lead them to hospitalization and severe illness and death. Um, these are the major options that we have thus far. Um, for the vast majority of patients, probably option number one is going to be Paxlovid. So again, this is a protease inhibitor against the, the virus, um, and it is boosted with an old HIV medication called uh, ritonavir. So it does reduce the risk of hospitalization in high-risk people by a pretty significant amount. The big issue with this is going to be that ritonavir. Um, it can cause significant drug-drug interactions. So for example, in transplant patients who I take care of, it can lead to incredibly high levels of uh, tacrolimus or prograf, which can in and of themselves lead to kidney failure and require hospitalization. If you have somebody who's gonna have a significant drug-drug interaction with Paxlovid, the next option for most outpatients is probably gonna be the monoclonal antibody. So initially, um, this was citrovimab, and it was studied against BA1. 
as the virus has evolved and we've seen the emergence of BA2, it turns out that citrovimab is not so effective against BA2. So we're now using a new um, yeah, monoclonal called bebtilovimab. Um, bebtilovimab, uh, we infer from the citrovimab, also has a pretty significant benefit in terms of reducing the risk for hospitalization. If that's not available, you can have people come in for uh, three-day courses of remdesivir. Um, if you have the facilities, uh, some medical centers have set up an outpatient remdesivir infusion program. Um, we, we actually have one for our transplant patients just because we can't really use it for, uh, we can't really use Paxlovid in that population. And again, pretty significant uh, relative risk of reducing hospitalization. The last option is this medication called molnupiravir. Um, so molnupiravir has a different mechanism of action from Paxlovid, where it's actually affecting the DNA polymerase. The benefit in terms of reducing risk of hospitalization is definitely lower. And then again, on a larger population concern, the, you know, this medication is potentially mutagenic. And so there is this concern that it's going to drive more mutation of the virus and it's going to lead to selection of more trans or help aid in the selection of more transmissible virus or, or more severe virus. Um, one thing we recently have some at least uh, initial press release data. So they looked at Paxlovid and otherwise healthy people who don't have the traditional risk factors for progression to severe disease. And actually there was not a whole lot of benefit to using this medication in otherwise healthy people who, you know, in general would not have a very high risk of uh, requiring hospitalization, developing hypoxia. One of the things that has been reported quite often in the literature has been this rebound phenomenon. You do five days of Paxlovid, you feel better, but then about two to eight days after you stop, you get recurrence of symptoms. At least in this study from the Mayo Clinic population, this was uncommon. It happened in less than 1% of people. And the vast majority of people who had recurrent symptoms had very, very mild symptoms. The one thing that they do point out is this kind of rebound phenomenon may not just be the Paxlovid, it may actually be part of the natural history of the Omicron lineage. So something that we'll have to pay attention to going forward. We have some more data in terms of managing outpatients. And you know, two of the things that I want to emphasize is that one, from the recovery trial, which at this point was about a year and a half ago, steroids are not a benefit to the vast majority of outpatients who are not hypoxic. In fact, it may dampen the immune response and lead to more viral replication, and it may actually worsen things. So if the patient is not hypoxic, doesn't require hospitalization, you're seeing them in clinic or hearing about them over the phone, I would not give those patients steroids. More recently, we finally have some of the data from this large outpatient study of repurposed medications. One of the arms is ivermectin. And from that data, at least this dose of ivermectin that was used in this population, there did not seem to be any benefit to ivermectin. So again, I think we now have ample evidence to say, don't use ivermectin in these patients. We're still waiting for some data on inhaled fluticasone and fluvoxamine, two of the other arms in active six. Hopefully uh, that data will be forthcoming relatively soon and we'll have even more options for our patients. For hospitalized patients, there haven't been many major changes. Um, I refer people to the NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines. Right now, it's a combination of steroids from Desivir with the addition of adding um, a Janus kinase inhibitor, baricitinib, or an IL-6 inhibitor, tocilizumab, depending on the severity of disease. Um, we are awaiting some further clinical trial results. Um, Active 3 IM is looking at immunomodulator, other immunomodulators that might be used instead of uh, some of these other ones that we're already using. And then um, this other agent as well, we're awaiting results relatively soon. The big vaccine announcements. So we now actually have an EUA for the Novavax vaccine. So the Novavax vaccine, the major advantage is that it is a traditional vaccine platform in that it's purified spike protein with an adjuvant. So, you know, one of the, the many things that people who report hesitancy about the mRNA vaccine site is the fact that it's new technology, it hasn't been well studied. So for at least that subset of patients, um, we now have something that's a little bit more traditional 
that we can recommend to them. Um, Dr. Slotek will probably touch on this a little bit, but we finally do have an EUA for vaccines in children under age five. So the very youngest kids, which would be a two-dose Moderna series or a three-dose Pfizer series. And then again, looking forward, seeing if we can stop the, the Omicron cycle, um, Moderna developed a bivalent vaccine. So it has both wild type and Omicron spike proteins. And uh, they had an immunologic endpoint where they looked at antibody levels. And it does look like this bivalent vaccine was able to boost those antibody levels about eightfold. So very promising. This may be something that we have uh, by the fall potentially. I'll stop there. Um, that's the end of the updates. And then I think we're gonna move on to um, questions and then case discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Ponce. That was a whirlwind tour and um, you did it expertly in the very small amount of time that we allowed you to have. So uh, we really appreciate you. Um, I wanted to uh, acknowledge a couple of comments and a question or two in the chat. Um, first off, our colleague, Dr. Jose Cadena over at our VA hospital made the observation that 32 of 48 cases reported by employees were actually diagnosed by the home antigen test. And so all of these data that we're looking at, be it regionally, um, statewide or nationally, um, are limited by the fact that if people are testing at home and not telling anybody about it, um, then we can't really count the cases. So, so it's got to be an undercount. So thank you for that observation. Um, uh, Shafkat Shah says, can you comment on indications to use the antivirals and antibodies and steroids? Could, so you, you did have a nice slide on that, uh, Dr. Ponce, but could you just reiterate to kind of summarize, when do you use steroids? When do you not use steroids? Uh, when do you pick an antiviral or an antibody? Sure. So um, steroids, no steroids. So if somebody is being hospitalized for COVID, usually meaning that they have hypoxia, um, so uh, oxygen saturation of 94% or less on room air, that's really the indication when, when you pull the trigger on dexamethasone. If you look at the initial recovery trial and you gave the dexamethasone to people who sought hospital care but were not hypoxic and you gave them steroids, they actually did worse. So hypoxia you know, need for hospitalization is really the trigger for steroid use. In terms of when to use the antivirals, again, the outcomes for all of these antiviral studies is reducing the need for hospitalization in high-risk people. So those are all the, the big risk factors that we've known from the wild-type emergence um, contribute to the risk for hospitalization, severe disease, and death. So that includes things like uh, older age, so age greater than 65, um, obesity, uh, the underlying cardiopulmonary disease, um, immunologic uh, uh, or immunocompromising conditions like transplant, uh, like cancer-related chemotherapy, et cetera. So in, in that population who have at least one risk factor for progression to high-risk disease, that's when you want to use one of these antiviral medications. Um, for most patients, again, um, on the outpatient side, Paxlovid would probably be your go-to just because it's something that you can have them pick up via the drive through at their local pharmacy. But again, the limitation there is gonna be drug-drug interactions. Um, barring that, probably the second line option would be infusion of the monoclonal antibody. At least here in San Antonio, we have a regional infusion center. So you can just uh, send a referral for this infusion to the center and they'll coordinate with the patient to bring them in and give them the antibody infusion. Depending on what's going on at your local hospitals, you may have the opportunity uh, or the option of giving people um, three-day courses of outpatient remdesivir. But again, that's going to be very institution and very locality uh, driven. Um, so it's just something you have to suss out if there's anybody in your community who's offering that. Again, molnupiravir would probably be my last option for these patients, both because of the reduced efficacy and also because of the theoretical risk of increased mutagenicity and uh, on a population level, just selecting for the emergence of even more variants. Um, thank you. Um, those are some complex uh, changes in practice that we're all uh, getting used to. I think that was well stated and well summarized. And I do invite people to, to speak up in the chat if you, if you want more clarification. Put your very specific question and we will try to get to as many of them as we can 
Any questions that we don't get to now, uh, we'll try to uh, send you an answer subsequently if you've provided your email address. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and move towards the cases. And so I'm going to ask our Echo Hub coordinator, Carly, to please bring up the first case. And this is a pediatric case. And this is a case that both Dr. Svatek and I have familiarity with. Um, and I'm looking forward to her insights. So we have a seven-year-old child, a female child, who developed a runny nose and a home kit was positive for COVID-19. Her mother called and she wanted to know, do you have any guidance on the best way to have my seven-year-old daughter be evaluated for remdesivir for COVID? And by the way, we just heard Dr. Ponce say that there is an indication for outpatient use of COVID, I mean, of remdesivir, um, for COVID, but that it is very uh, location dependent as to whether facilities are providing outpatient access to remdesivir. Anyway, so here's a mom worried about her kid and wants to know, can her daughter get remdesivir? Um, she goes on to say that her daughter has a history of difficult to treat strider with viral upper respiratory infections, that historically these infections start with a runny nose in the daytime, and then by evening, the child has strider with chest retractions. In fact, this child has needed emergency room care 17 times and was actually in critical care for a few days once. So this is an unusual child um, with an extraordinary history of needing to go to the emergency room. Sounds like every time she gets a cold. Um, there is no history of COVID-19. The child does currently have basically congestion and feels a little achy, was not particularly febrile, not short of breath. Uh, the child had been vaccinated um, with the mRNA vaccine and um, was not on any medication, although the mother reported that they did have dexamethasone at home from prior episodes of Strider. Um, both the mom and the dad have advanced education. We put that in here because this is a health literacy echo and we always want to take into account who it is we're talking to um, in order to calibrate how we speak. And even when we have people with advanced levels of education, we need to remember about using plain language and not making assumptions about what the person may or may not know. On the review of symptoms, the pertinent positives, again, were a runny nose. And actually two days later in, in this story, the child went on to develop what the mom said was a croupy cough. Um, there was no loss of smell and also pertinent negative was that the child was not short of breath, was not wheezing, and the physical exam on telemed as best we could assess was that there was no fever, uh, there was a pulse oximeter that was being used correctly and the child had the normal oxygenation. Um, so again, this is a highly educated parent um, concerned about her child. She, this parent has a high level of health literacy. And my main concern related to the patient and her parents' understanding was about COVID-19 management. So we have the following questions for our ECHO panelists, namely Dr. Svatek. Um, what COVID-19 outpatient regimen is available for children under the age of 12? Yeah, so that that is and that was embedded into that question. So the remdesivir, so that's a little bit complicated because you know we talk about the adult population and having probably more access to clinics because that's an IV infusion. But then when you start asking around for the pediatric population and having that availability, really what you're having to look at is probably ED settings. Um, or short-term observation settings because you have to have three doses on three consecutive days and it's IV administration where you have to have observation. And so if you're looking specifically at the one antiviral that can do that, that's 28 days and greater than 3.5 kilograms that can qualify. So that's your less than 12. And that's kind of what you're left with and then you have to look at that high risk criteria. So I tried to drop in the chat one, the table um, that helps and gives you guidance for outpatient therapy set forth by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And then number two, looking at the high risk criteria, which this particular individual did not uh, fulfill. Um, for, you know, specifically if you were talking about her age being the age of seven, 
And then her being, um, you know, you know, the first thing that you also have to talk about is BMI. We do have a significant population that's obese here in San Antonio, but she didn't fulfill that criteria. Um, she didn't have asthma. She's got recurrent croup. Um, so didn't necessarily fit um, in that as well. And so, um, you know, fortunately, our hospitalization rates, you know, are low for, for children with COVID. We do have to think about, though, that with Omicron, we did start seeing increased hospitalization rates for children. And so this kind of goes back and forth with, you know, you know, wondering, you know, what are the, our next options and our next steps uh, for therapy? Um, the other, you know, pre-exposure prophylaxis, the Evusheld, that's going to be at the mark uh, from the information that I obtained. And that's going to be for your moderate to severe immunosuppressed. And that's pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that um, obviously wouldn't fit into that. And then you have your monoclonal antibody, the bevtelovimab. But that, again, that treatment is IV and it's for children 12 and above. Um, and so you're, 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 and then if you talk about Paxlovid, that's also a treatment for children 12 and above. And that's oral administration. And you can get that uh, at the pharmacy. So, so there, there you have it as, as far as your options. Is there a dose adjustment for 12 year olds on Paxlovid or they get an adult dose? So right now from what I see is that 12 and above gets the same dose. If you have any sort of renal disease, then they will adjust that dose. Anybody can feel free to correct. Um, you know, if you have a liver problems, then that also needs to be discussed. Okay. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, how this case was managed? Right. So, you know, as far as options, you have a very worried parent um, and you have a child that's had recurrent visits for, for croup, including an ICU visit that doesn't um, fit the criteria for remdesivir. Um, and when you really talk about even the data, um, you're really limited on any of the treatments and then access to the treatments. She's too young to receive that dosing of the Paxlovid. You don't know, um, one, there's little pediatric data behind that. And so that's where, you know, you can see this case developing of this fluvoxamine and there was some discussion with infectious, pediatric infectious disease and myself, um, you know, this being an SSRI, um, SSRIs are used in the pediatric uh, population. Um, there, you know, obviously there is some discussion about prolonged QTC, but really a lot of the data is pretty limited in having that concern. Um, but knowing some of the side effects, um, trialing through something perhaps that isn't um, proven, um, but has shown proven benefit in older individuals. Um, that, that was what was discussed and, and really trying to make a decision on perhaps trying a lower dose and seeing where we progress from there. Um, to expand from this specific case to a broader question that's highly relevant that I saw in the chat from one of our participants, um, what if you're seeing a kid and you've got both COVID-19 documented and you know this is a child with asthma and you think that this, is a, this child's asthma might really be getting revved up and exacerbated, um, should you hesitate to use your steroids for the asthma because of the consideration that COVID early use of steroids in COVID-19 has been shown by our studies to be a bad thing. How do you right. manage that? I know that that gets a, a little scary and hairy and trying to make those medical decision making. So one, we, we do as far as, you know, peds hospitalists, you know, inpatient therapies um, for kids that are requiring oxygen, um, there is still recommendations to use steroids in that situation. You have a child presenting with an asthma exacerbation um, you do have, and that child can fit that high risk criteria for talking about the alternative therapies. Um, one, you, you do have to talk about what are the therapies for asthma 
And it's one of those risk benefits. We our our usual therapies for asthma are using steroids. We haven't been given newer data that says in an asthma exacerbation with COVID not to use steroids. And so that's where I would continue to use that. Thank you very much, Dr. Svatek. I'm gonna move us on to the second case and I'm gonna ask uh, Carly to please bring up the second case report form. And um, this is uh, an individual who presented to infectious disease clinic and the consultation was really for a urinary tract infection. Um, this was a 54 year old woman with advanced ovarian cancer um, who was also being treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, pembrolizumab uh, for her advanced ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, she had progressed to have obstruction of both of her ureters and had stents placed bilaterally. These had become colonized with pseudomonas and uh, she was highly symptomatic. And so she was referred to me amazingly that she was still, it was an amazing thing that she was still outpatient and relatively stable with um, pseudomonas in her urinary tract with stents. Um, but upon my history taking, the patient disclosed to me that she was unvaccinated versus COVID-19. And she said that she was terrified to be vaccinated, that her fear was based on how it might impact her cancer or that she might become terribly ill and decompensate from her cancer, um, which if she received the COVID vaccine. Uh, she also thinks she might've had COVID uh, last fall and she wondered if that meant that she was protected and she shouldn't worry, don't do anything because you're already protected from your natural infection. Um, I asked her if she was aware of the monoclonal antibody in pro prophylactic approach of using Evusheld. And this was a highly educated woman who was unaware that there was uh, the option of Evusheld and had not heard about it from her other care providers, including her oncologist. Um, so that was pretty much the summary of her history. We don't know that she had had COVID-19 previously. She was not currently symptomatic related to COVID in any way, but she was unvaccinated and I'm an infectious disease doctor. And so this concerned me. The main medication of relevance was the immune checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab, which is obviously a treatment that uh, was gone to after other treatments had failed. Um, this uh, patient is highly functional, but not able to work due to medical disability. Uh, her spouse was vaccinated against COVID-19 and she was really suffering just from urinary tract related symptoms and wasn't in any physical kind of distress. Um, so if you could scroll on down to where my questions come, um, I would like to know, uh, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Markels to share her clinical wisdom um, since this is an infectious disease case, how do you address uh, COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in this kind of a patient in this setting? Yes, thank you. This is really important. And I, and I love how that she didn't come to you for, for this question specifically, but still as an infectious disease physician, this is something that um, concerned you and that you wanted to address. And I, and I think it's really important to really understand the fears and, and try and show as, you know, really demonstrate empathy when trying to understand where a patient um, develops these fears and work through them um, in a very non-judgmental way. So I think it's, you know, although we understand the benefit of this vaccine, um, we, it's, it's different for every individual and clearly her husband was vaccinated. So, so she does have some likely very concerns about how it's going to impact her, her cancer. So I'd work through that with her and I would talk about how specifically, um, in patients that are immunosuppressed and high risk patients, that, um, this would be a situation where I really would want to, um, promote the vaccine. I mean, this is not taken into consideration in the consideration the checkpoint inhibitor and how that may impact her response to the vaccine, but just talking about vaccine in, in general. So again, I think it's just an opportunity. You're getting to know this patient to not be um, pushy, to be receptive, to understand. And it may not be a conversation that you address all in one visit. So I've had patients like this where I've met with them 
um, more than one time, especially since they were coming in for a different reason, but just starting to really understand them and, and be there to provide information. And again, the big, biggest thing that um, is not to pass judgment, to understand, to listen, and provide um, information in, under, in a way that's understandable to the patient. Um, so again, kind of making sure we don't use a lot of medical jargon, really speaking to in, in a way that's understandable. Thank you so much. And just to underline a point, because, you know, we have a broad audience from all sorts of backgrounds. Is there any reason that infectious disease doctors should worry about giving the COVID vaccination in somebody that has cancer? No, I, I haven't been worried I, at all. And again, like when, if you think at, about the beginning of the vaccine and the rollout, we really were looking for the highest risk patients. And these patients are, are one of the highest risk patients. And so, no, we, right now we've, we've certainly, we have so much data to demonstrate that it's, that it's safe in this population. Again, she has a specific medication that may make it less effective, but not unsafe. It just may not be as effective, but it will still not be um, unsafe. Thank you so much for clarifying that. So now I'm going to go to Dr. Ponce because you have extensive experience with all kinds of immunocompromised hosts. And so could you just review with us um, what kinds of cancer patients are the ones that we should be offering uh, um, Evusheld as a preventative for? Uh, the short answer, all of them, <laughs> uh, honestly. So as Dr. Markell's referenced, so, you know, many of the, the therapies that we use in, in the oncology setting uh, attenuate the body's ability to respond to the vaccine. And so I think the biggest risk to many of our, our immunocompromised patients is that they have a false sense of security because they have been vaccinated. Um, you know, in the transplant world, even after you know, three, four, five vaccine doses, you're still looking at about 30% of that population who will not mount a serologic response to, uh, to the vaccine. So at this point, we know that um, any cancer patient is at increased risk for severe outcomes of COVID. And I think I would feel, you know, uh, I would be pretty liberal in terms of re referring those patients for Evisheld. Um, the one thing, again, that we have to keep in mind, so Evisheld will last in their system about six months. What we've already seen, as we've seen evolution from Delta to BA1 to BA2, is that the, the two monoclonals in the Evisheld, are, uh, one of them no longer really works, um, which is why now we're recommending a double dose of the Evisheld, so that the the you know, the, the active monoclonal gets to a good therapeutic concentration. And we'll just have to see if we see continuing selection for BA4 and BA5, Evisheld may no longer be a good pre-exposure prophylaxis option. So it's something that we have to monitor very closely. Um, Dr. Ponce, with increasing use of immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs for cancer immunotherapy, such as uh, pembrolizumab, but that's a, there's a whole class of drugs like this, do these drugs, these immune checkpoint inhibitors, do they impede the, re the vaccine response? So as far as we, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, no. So um, the checkpoint inhibitors generally lead to increased proliferation of T cells. And so it's that endogenous T cell response that then goes on to fight off the cancer. They generally don't affect the B cells uh, in the same way as rituxan or some of the cytotoxic therapies do. So if you're going to be on uh, you know, any kind of um, chemotherapy, a checkpoint inhibitor in the setting of COVID is probably a good one. Um, um, the theoretical concern with the checkpoint inhibitors, we know that a lot of the damage of uh, COVID-19 is actually uh, mediated by an overactive immune response. And you have somebody who is on a medication that allows for increased uh, T cell proliferation and activity. So there's there a theoretical concern that anybody on a checkpoint inhibitor might be at higher risk for severe disease. The counterpoint to that is that you have more T cells that may be able to fight off the virus a little bit 
uh, earlier. There's been a recent study um, looking at patients on checkpoint inhibitors controlling for age and other comorbidities. And it actually looks like the checkpoint inhibitor in and of itself is not a risk factor for progression to severe disease. But again, you have somebody who is probably quite sick, quite debilitated. I definitely would not hesitate to give them every shelter. Thank you. I'm going to ask our uh, pharmacist, uh, Lindsay, there you are. Um, could you comment for us, please, about um, the side effects of Evusheld? And if possible, where can people access Evusheld? Yeah, of course. So most common side effects are things like headache, fatigue, cough. There is a side effect listed in the uh, EUA that also highlights hypersensitivity reaction was noted in several patients within the studies that led to its EUA approval. So that is something you might want to make sure your patients are aware of prior to receiving that product. Here in San Antonio, we do have a clinic called the Evusheld Clinic that's located at the Pavilion, which is in the medical center here through university. But I'm sure there are other type of clinics throughout the state that you could refer to on an online platform to try to get your patients scheduled. But it is a mint. Uh, the primary care team does refer patients to that clinic and it sounds like it's been going well thus far, so. Sorry for the glitch with my audio. Um, I wanted to mention that at UT Health uh, Mays Cancer Center, uh, there is also the availability of the Evusheld. It is an injection, not an infusion, but it does require a prolonged period of observation. Um, and that is why there's a lot of specificity to what places uh, provide this. This has unfortunately led to a, low, a lower than desirable demand for Evusheld um, by our practitioners in the community. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're highlighting it here. Dr. Markels, uh, what's your experience with Evusheld at BAMC? Oh, so at BMC, we have specifically um, reached out to our specialty clinics, mostly um, HEMA, Garbo Marrow Transplant Service, Rheumatology, um, Nephrology, Internal Medicine, basically our adult, most of our adult clinics and let them know that we have it. And then it's available to give at any of, of the clinics. And so we're, we're going through a list of our high-risk patients and, and proactively reaching out to them and trying to get them um, the every shout. Uh, but every one of our clinics can do it. And we are, and there are, aren't many concerns about the, the monitoring. Um, we have the space and, and we have um, the capability in, in our schedule. Okay, um, I'm watching the time pretty carefully and I want to um, honor some of the things that are in the chat. And there's a dialogue with doc, one of our other panelists who hasn't spoken very much yet. Um, Dr. Feibelkorn, can you talk to us a little bit about um, what's going on with variants? And there was a question um, about whether our positivity numbers posted somewhere for local healthcare professionals to access. And Debbie Cardell says uh, she's also interested in the local variant data that were shown on Dr. Ponce's slide. Are they publicly available? Dr. Feibelkorn, can you unmute and tell us? Yes, yes, um, thank you. So um, those numbers that I was putting in, that's sort of a spot check where we take a look at, you know, of the specimens we receive from different locations internally, how many of them are positive for COVID. We do report to the health department and those are folded into that. We don't have that. Um, uh, as a public facing thing out of university health that I'm aware of. But as I had mentioned in the chat, um, uh, over the past several days, we're now seeing over 50% positivity rate in our urgent care clinics, which are called Express Med. Um, it's lower in the emergency department. Um, uh, it's more like 28% overall. Um, so we're not seeing it in the more urgently ill individuals. Uh, as far as the variant information, our public facing dashboard, I've put a link in the chat and actually Dr. Wu has also uh, put it there as well. Um, and that is our public facing dashboard when pretty much right after we finish a new run of variant sequencing, then that gets incorporated into that. So that's updated uh, quite frequently and you can see that data that Dr. Ponce shared there. All right, I would like to also toss this to you, um, Dr. Feibelkorn. Dr. Sanka asks, on our immunocompromised patients, when do we consider Evusheld? Do we, and here's the part for you, uh, do we check titers? 
to see vaccine response before we consider giving Evusheld to somebody who may be a vaccine non-responder because they're getting immunosuppressive medicines. Can you talk about using an, the, a laboratory test of an antibody titer to make a decision about Evusheld? Um, I can talk a little bit about the test and, and then I might toss that back to Dr. Ponce, who I know had, had responded to this as well as far as indications. Um, I will say that none of the current generally used antibody tests give what we might call a titer, meaning an actual quantitative number that you want to have a cutoff for. You're going to get a yes, no answer. Um, uh, so, um, but with that, I, I think Dr. Ponce had also responded in the, in the chat that there was not a currently a recommendation to check antibody levels in that population. Um, so that's exactly right. The, the antibody levels that we reference in these clinical trials are uh, levels of neutralizing antibody, whereas many of the commercially available tests, they check for an an antibody against, you know, the spike protein or the nucleocapsid protein, but we don't yet have sufficient data to say that that level is equivalent to neutralizing antibody level. That may have changed, Dr. Fibelkorn, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's been the limitation of most of the commercially available tests up to this point. Um, so at this point, there's no recommendation to check uh, antibody levels There's uh, to make a decision. Um, as I put in my chat, with the immunocompromised population, I think you need to take uh, extra precautions, especially in the setting where we're not doing a lot of the stuff to slow transmission as we had been doing, I would say assume that they are not well protected and try to maximize whatever you can give them. So that includes full vaccination series and then uh, prophylactic monoclonals if you can. Well, thank you. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, the best way to manage COVID-19 is, of course, to prevent COVID-19 infection. COVID is still out there, and all of you who joined us today are now more up to date than you were, and all of us continue to learn together. So I want to thank each one of our panelists, um, Lindsay Groff, Mandy Svatek, uh, Kristen Feibelkorn, and um, Elizabeth Markels, and of course, our presenter, Dr. Phil Ponce, for an outstanding review. Uh, please join us next week for Tess Barton, pediatric infectious disease specialist, who will be giving us a presentation about pediatric long COVID. And with that, I turn the microphone over to our Echo Hub, Dr. Roquel Romero. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I want to be echoing and in the words that Dr. Bergen said very well. Dr. Bergen, thank you so much for being the moderator in the session today. And thank you, you all, to be part of this discussion. Thank you. We have an excellent discussion. And please join us. Mark your calendar for our next session. You want to receive a Zoom a link and your emails, please look on those and mark your calendar for our next session. If you have a case to present, please send that to us. If you have another suggestions, please send us to us. And the code uh, for these credits, uh, it was one question in the chat is one zero zero eight nine nine zero nine. Thank you very much. And until then, take care. Thank you so much.